you're back with us on America's Forum. I'm J.D. Hayworth. And I'm John Bachman. J.D., let's get to the second part of our interview with Rich Lowry. In this part, you'll hear him talk about that nightmare scenario. What happens if the Republicans don't win back control of the Senate in 2014? Plus, you'll hear his take on Marco Rubio, Rand Paul, and Chris Christie. Well, you still have the House, which has blocking power. But if you had the Senate as well, you can really uh, pass legislation all the way through Congress and put the president in a very awkward position having to veto things. And the way the media coverage works, unfortunately, is the House can pass all right. the legislation at once, all the positive legislation at once, all the job legislation at once. And if Harry Reid decides not to do anything, well, it's the House that's the do-nothing body. Right. So that makes no sense. But if you have the, the Senate actually can pass things, then it's made clear to everyone who's, who's stopping, you know, say, um, big items on, on health care or big items on jobs. It's going to be the, the President of the United States that's going to have to veto it. And then you can use those next two years to kind of build the case against Obama-style liberalism in the run-up to the big election in 2016. Now, what would you like to see be the first uh, veto opportunity for President Obama, again, if the Republican Party does take control of the Senate? You know, some people have suggested, and I think this would be very clever and very telling, if you just basically you know, take the words from the Constitution about how the President should faithfully execute the laws and, you know, add, you know, this applies to Obamacare or something of that nature, pass it through Congress, what is he going to do? You know, is he going to veto something like that? So it'd be veto. very awkward, and there are just a, a whole host of things of that nature. And you know, he, the, the Democratic line on Obamacare is, okay, maybe it's not perfect, but we, we're open to fix this. Well, repeal the individual mandate. You know, repeal the employer mandate, which they keep on putting off. I want to see the whole thing repealed. But you could do these rifle shots and send them to the president and show his hypocrisy, and there's really no quote-unquote fix that he'd be willing to sign. It would also be interesting to see them enumerate all the changes that he's already made to the law and send that to his desk, too. That would yeah, be a Yeah, well, you know, there's well. a, a talking point against Republicans now that they voted to repeal the law 50 times, which is a, an inflated count. There have been some key repeal votes, but a lot of it has just right. been to, to rifle shot per certain parts of the legislation. And if you actually list, do the list of those votes and the unilateral changes, they're more it, that told, yeah, the, the unilateral changes definitely deflates the argument made by so many liberals and Democrats about how many times the Congress has voted to repeal or replace the law. Let's move past 2014 and talk about 2016. And I'm not going to ask you to name who you think the, the nominee is going to be, but out of, out of all the potentials right now... Good, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, none of us know. We've got to admit that. But who do you think um, has impressed you the most over the last, say, three months? Over the last three months, I'd say Marco Rubio has been very um, just a font of new policy ideas, which uh, I think is important. I think over the last year or so, the guy who's helped himself the most is clearly Ted Cruz, mm -hmm. who rose from just a very extremely junior freshman senator to a national figure of consequence. And he has a probably more of a claim than anyone else at the moment to the conservative base, which is obviously very important in a 2016 race. I have no doubt he's going to run, and he's going to be a big factor. Now, can Rubio get over, you know, I don't know necessarily want to use the word embarrassment, but the, the pushback he got from uh, stepping forward on the Gang of Eight immigration bill, is that over for him, or does he have a lot of ground to make up there? He still has ground to make up, and what he has to count on is just sheer time, and people will forget and forgive, but he, he, he got himself in a really odd situation because he's so invested in the Gang of Eight bill, did so much to make the case for it. Arguably, it wouldn't have passed at all if Rubio hadn't sort of uh, been out there every night, you know, talking to conservative media and tamping down some of the discontent. He did. He carried but, the water at the end there. Yeah, but over time, the discontent still um, with, with the, the base, because it's such a rotten bill, um, there was no uh, getting around it. So then when he realized just how politically harmful it was to him, he had to be in this weird situation where saying, well, I, I passed, this is my signature piece of legislation. The most important thing I've done as a politician, passing this through the Senate, and I don't want the House to pass it. And I don't think any senator has ever been in that situation before. So it's very awkward for him. Not all that different from what Romney had to do with Romney Care during the presidential election. So we'll see what happens there. Let's talk about Rand Paul a little bit. He seems to be a front runner in many aspects. He's got the younger uh, wing of the party, which was exemplified at CPAC. But he still scares a lot of people because of this neo-isolationist policy uh, he has, if you want to characterize like that. And his father called Edward Snowden a hero. Uh, certainly, 
uh, a dubious moniker considering, you know, we've talked to people like General Michael Hayden who said he has definitely put American lives at risk by releasing this information. Do you think if he would win the primary, the Republican base would really rally around him, especially the hawk base, you know, the, the, the foreign policy hawks? Well, the progression of kind of Paulite foreign policy and its standing in the Republican Party is, is very interesting because it's amazing if you, you think back to 2008 when Ron Paul ran and he would say the kind of things he does on foreign policy, it was a reliable um, invitation to all the other candidates to beat up on him yep. and for the audience to be on the side of those candidates beating up on them. Then you get to 2012, Ron Paul again saying basically the same things. It's getting a much more favorable hearing. You know, it's not a, necessarily applause lines. And then you have Rand Paul now saying a version of the same things. He, he tries to soften it some, and it's an applause line. And over the last several years, it has um, uh, been a, a point of view and an attitude on foreign policy that's been in the ascendancy of the Republican Party. What I, though, think shows the limits of how far he can go on this is Russia. Because he, he was wrong-footed on uh, the Crimea invasion initially, talking about people going out of their way to tweak Russia as if you know, there was something we'd done to make this happen. And the reaction of the Republican Party to the Crimea invasion just shows to me that, again, the central Republican reflex on foreign policy is strength. Now, especially when you can talk about something that involves strength without necessarily involving intervention, which everyone mm -hmm. is exhausted with at the moment. And that's where I think Rand Paul is going to going to have a bit of a problem. Now, you see a reemergence of, you know, Reagan-era type officials in this because they really understand the dynamics that are at play and still at play with the post-Soviet Russia uh, Federation, the burgeoning Russian Federation. Do you think there will be a reemergence? I mean, a lot of those guys are cast as establishment Republicans. Do you think that their voices will be amplified as a result of this increased tension with Russia? Yeah, I think it uh, highlights the essential truth of their view of the world. It's a very dangerous place, and if America doesn't lead, other people will lead or at least make trouble in our absence, because nature abhors a vacuum. And my fear is, uh, as fear of many other people, is that Putin's not going to stop here. And what he's doing r right at the moment is calculating his next move, and he's calculating it based on the Western reaction, and uh, w which has been much too... Um, tenuous for, for my taste so far. You've targeted some individuals, kicked them out of the G8, that's all good, but it has to go much broader and deeper than that and really hurt if you want to have some stopping power. Well, Jeannie, that last question was prompted by our interview last week with Pat Buchanan, who just gave us that geography lesson on those intricacies of Eastern Europe and the importance and the dynamics of the situation. Even so, it's worth noting that Pat Buchanan, as a former Nixon and Reagan aide with that thorough knowledge internationally you shared with us last week, that same Pat Buchanan was the author of the book, A Republic, Not an Empire, which caught grief in some establishment quarters because of its, quote, neo-isolationist point of view. John, for my money, I will tell you what, Pat Buchanan has been absolutely right on our borders, and our failure to, to heed him 20 years ago has put our nation in peril. Well, he's one of the guys you'll hear on America's Forum here and on Newsmax as well. You can reach out to us on social media, find us on our uh, platforms on Twitter, at Newsmax TV, hashtag America's Forum. We'll be back with more after this.